Table of Contents Journey Around the Rivers of America and Europe Dr. Sidney Socloth Dr. Sidney at Earthlink.net 2021 Elation by Dr. Sidney Socloth Zoe Phonemes And Nathan Cole Tove Would you like to be a looper? Would you like to be a looper over here? What is a looper? Is that the same as a youper? What's on your bucket list? Where did the term bucket list originate? The bucket list was a 2007 American comedy drama film directed by Rob Reiner and starring Jack Nicholson and Morgan Freeman. The main plot follows two terminally ill men, portrayed by Nicholson and Freeman, on their road trip, with a wish list of things to do before they kick the bucket, from which the movie's title gets its name. River cruises have become increasingly popular. Let's look at the relative pros and cons of river cruises versus ocean cruises. First of all, the ships used for river cruises are very limited by the size of rivers, canals, bridges, and locks. They generally accommodate 100 to 200 passengers, with about 120 to 150 being most typical. In contrast, ocean cruise ships are now up to in excess of 4,000 passengers. Although cruise ships in the Baltic and North Seas are typically around 2,000. However, that's still 10 to 20 times that of river cruises.
The smaller ship size means a higher cost for river cruises. Perhaps by a factor of 1.5 to 2. Also, the entertainment will be on a much smaller scale. Perhaps individual performers, rather than large ensembles or production numbers. However, sometimes local groups can come aboard on river cruises. The smaller ship size for river cruises means less distance from the cabin to the dining room or other places on the ship. As well as less crowds and less time exiting and entering the ship in various ports. The biggest ocean cruise ships have a passenger capacity of up to 6,600 with a crew of 1,500 for a total of 8,100 souls. The overall length is up to almost 1,000 feet, with a waterline width of 150 feet. In contrast river cruise ships have between 100 and 200 passengers, although the American Queen on the Mississippi River can accommodate 436, and there are often around 400 on the Volga and other Russian rivers. Although there is no ultimate limitation on the size of ocean-going cruise ships, most river cruise ships are designed in such a way not to waste any space and just fit into the locks. This is a lock on the Danube River. For example, the lock width along the Main Danube Canal is 12 meters or 40 feet. So all ships can have a maximum width of 11.4 meters. The length of the locks is 190 meters or 625 feet. The length of river ships is generally limited to 443 feet, 135 meters, and the width to 38 feet, 11.5 meters, due to the constraints of the lock dimensions. So. These river cruise boats are limited to a maximum width of 11.4 meters, or 37.4 feet. And length of 190 meters or 625 feet. The actual length is typically 135 meters, or 443 feet. The width limitation of 37.4 feet means that there will be no inside cabins in just one central passageway. The height of the river boats is also limited by bridge clearances. Typically, there are four decks total, with two and a half decks above the water line. This shows the pilot house in the raised position above the sun deck. To allow for passage under bridges, the pilot house is lowered. The pilot houses on the river barges also must be lowered to pass under the low bridges. The number of decks above the water line is limited by bridge clearance to no more than two or three, whereas ocean ships can have as many as 18 decks. Here's an example of a Ryan and Danube cruise that I was on. Down. Low this is the sun deck that has been cleared in advance of the low bridge. Here we are going neighbor. under the bridge. You'll always know your pal if you ever navigate Here we are right under the bridge. However, sometimes the bridges are high enough to allow passage without the sun deck being cleared. So, basically, we're talking about the river cruise boats being more like canal boats. This is the John A. Roebling Suspension Bridge, Cincinnati. Built in 1856 to 1857. In contrast, river cruise ships on the lower Mississippi River between St. Louis and New Orleans are not limited by locks and the bridge are high. An example is the American Queen. The American Queen is said to be the largest river steamboat ever built. 
It was built in 1995 and is a six-deck recreation of a classic Mississippi River boat. It can accommodate 436 passengers and 160 crew. In further contrast, the largest cruise ship in the world is the Royal Caribbean Symphony of the Seas, launched in April 2018. With 18 decks, it accommodates 6,680 passengers and 2,200 crew for a total of nearly 9,000. Cunard's Queen Victoria is the largest passenger ship to sail the Amazon to Mahanaus, 800 miles upstream, with 2,000 passengers aboard. There is almost no motion of the ship on river cruises as compared to ocean cruises, where rough weather and seas may be encountered. Of course with river cruises there are the possibilities of the water level being too high with inadequate bridge clearances, or too low so the boat cannot proceed in this case of the Amaserena on the Ryan. Ballasts were emptied to reduce the draft from the normal 1.65 meters to 1.48 meters. Instead of carrying one week of fresh water, they carried only 1.5 days of water. You can go to this website to check on current river levels. In the case of a cruise interruption due to high or low water levels, there are generally these three options available. Continue the affected itinerary by having guests swap ships, typically being bussed from one town to the next, where you will embark a sister ship or similar vessel to continue the rest of your journey. Complete the itinerary as far as possible and board your ship, and then transition to hotels, on the company's expense, to complete the remainder of your itinerary. Outright cancellation. This is the rarest option. Exercised when no other options are available. Most of the time on ocean cruises you are out of sight of land. And only the ocean to look at. On the rivers, you are always in sight of land. And have a view of riverside towns, cities, and countryside that is always changing. The ports of call on river cruises are often short overnight travels, so most days are spent in ports, typically for 8 to 10 hours, or more. On ocean cruises, there are often days at sea with no port, and port days are sometimes limited to just a few hours. On a river cruise you are often docked along the riverfront right in the city center. In contrast, on an ocean cruise you are often docked a long distance from the city center in some cases this might involve a long train ride of two or three hours each way. Let's look at a summary of the relative pros and cons of river cruises versus ocean cruises. How to go The two basic choices are by land and by water. By land you can choose independent travel or group tours. Independent travel can be going to just one major destination like Paris, or London, or Amsterdam. To visit an entire country or region requires a means of transportation. This can be by train, rental car, or camping. If you're young, Youth hostels may be a choice. For somewhat older people, a rental car, train, or a motor home, in the UK, called a motor caravan, may be a choice. The countries in Europe are small compared to the US. Distances are short, and the train system is generally very good. For some, Train travel, especially with a Eurail Pass may be a good option. The roads in Western Europe are generally very good, 
so road travel by rental car is a possible choice. There are lots of campgrounds also. So a rental or lease of an RV, such as a motorhome is another possibility, especially for a longer trip. For many people the best choice may be a group tour by motor coach. These typically are in the range of 7 to 21 days and often cover several countries. The advantage is having everything planned and taken care of for you. The disadvantages are lack of independence and choice, and the necessity of packing and unpacking in a new lodging almost every day. Most places of interest in Northern Europe are within easy reach of water either by the North and Baltic Seas, or by the many navigable rivers. Therefore ocean, or river cruises can be an attractive option. A big advantage here is that your lodging travels with you. You don't have to pack and unpack every day. Pre and post cruise extensions it is highly recommended to arrive in the cruise departure city at least one, and preferably several days before the cruise begins. This is typically what is offered in a cruise extension in Amsterdam. It is indeed pricey at $1,150 to $1,200 for a couple for the two nights. You may wish to consider doing it on your own for much less. Instead of $1,200 for a couple for two nights, you can get a good hotel, such as the Ibis Amsterdam Center, next to the train station, for $160 a night. This shows the location of the Hotel Ibis Amsterdam Center very close to the Amsterdam Central Station. It's just a short walk of about 10 minutes from the hotel to the River Cruise Terminal. This is typically what is offered in a cruise extension in Budapest. It's kind of pricey at $800 for a couple for the two nights. Again, you can do it on your own for much less. Instead of $800 for a couple for two nights, you can get a good hotel, such as the Ibis Budapest Centrum for $70 a night. When to go? It depends on the factors of availability, climate, cost, and crowds. A good website to see a very comprehensive listing of river cruises is rivercruise.com. You can use this to filter your search. Or you can select custom search for an even more specialized search. These are some of the rivers included in the rivercruise.com website. Rivercruise.com is a division of vacations to go which is a good source for information about ocean cruises. This is data extracted from the rivercruise.com website. A division of vacations to go on the number of cruises from Amsterdam to Budapest. Approximately the same number go in the reverse direction. Budapest to Amsterdam. This is data extracted from the rivercruise.com website on the number of cruises on the Rhine from Amsterdam to Basel in Switzerland. Approximately the same number go in the reverse direction. Basel to Amsterdam. This is data extracted from the rivercruise.com website on the number of cruises on the Rhine list by cruise line. We see that the largest cruise line is Viking, followed by Avalon as a close second. This is data extracted from the rivercruise.com website on the number of cruises that include both the Rhine and Danube, listed by cruise line. We see that the largest cruise line is again Viking, followed by Avalon as distant second. 
This is data extracted from the RiverCruise.com website on the number of cruises from Amsterdam to Bucharest. Approximately the same number go in the reverse direction. Bucharest to Amsterdam. We see that the largest cruise line is again Viking. Followed by Avalon is distant second. This is a comparison the approximate cost of various types of cruises per person, per day. The Mississippi River cruises are from roughly $250 to $500. The Rhine and Danube cruises from Amsterdam to Budapest range from about $400 to $800 in contrast. Ocean cruises of 14 to 21 days are roughly in the range of $125 to $500. Another highly recommended website is CruiseCritic.com. It has information about cruises. As well as reviews and discussions with cruise ship passengers. How to get there. From here in the villages, there are two basic choices in getting over there. That is by air or by sea. By sea would require a transatlantic cruise from a nearby port. Port Canaveral. Port Everglades, Fort Lauderdale. Or the Port of Miami. Transatlantic cruises from Florida ports, Fort Lauderdale and Miami, to Europe are repositioning cruises in which ships are transferred from many cruises in the Caribbean to mostly Mediterranean ports. These transatlantic cruises from Florida ports to Europe are from late February through April or early May. Most of these are in April. Very few transatlantic cruises go from Florida ports, Fort Lauderdale and Miami to northern European ports. And these are all in April. The most numerous transatlantic cruises from Florida ports are from Fort Lauderdale to Amsterdam or Rotterdam in the Netherlands. These are all in April. And in 2020, there are six cruises with durations ranging from 16 to 31 days. There are also a few transatlantic cruises from Florida ports to Copenhagen. These are all in April. And in 2020, there are three cruises that end in Copenhagen. And two other cruises that have a port call in Copenhagen as part of a Baltic cruise. Returning from Europe the situation is similar. Except that now ships are leaving Europe starting in mid-October. And going through November. For example. From either Amsterdam or Rotterdam to Florida. There is only one cruise. That being a 29-day cruise from Rotterdam to Fort Lauderdale. The six-month gap between outbound and inbound repositioning cruises across the Atlantic can pose a major problem for those wanting to go by sea both ways. Regularly Scheduled Transatlantic Voyages This is an example of some of the regularly scheduled transatlantic voyages from New York to Southampton. This is an example of the itinerary of the regularly scheduled transatlantic voyages from New York to Southampton. These voyages are on the Cunard Line ship Queen Mary 2, with 3,064 passenger capacity and 1,253 crew. This is an example of the itinerary of the regularly scheduled transatlantic voyages from Southampton to New York. This is an example of the itinerary of voyages from Southampton to New York by air. To get there by air the local airports are Orlando, MCO, Sanford, SFB, Tampa, TPA, Gainesville, GNV, and Jacksonville, 
JAX. For transatlantic travel the best option would probably be Orlando, MCO, as having, by far, the most flights. For Baltic cruises, Copenhagen, CPH, is the most popular departure port. With Amsterdam, AMS, being a somewhat distant second. For river cruises on the most popular Rhine and Danube itineraries, Amsterdam is a clear leader, with Budapest in a distant second place. There are non stop flights from Orlando, MCO to both Amsterdam, on Delta, and Copenhagen, on Norwegian as well as other destinations such as Frankfurt, London, Munich, Paris, and Zurich. There are direct flights from Sanford, SFB, to Amsterdam on TUI every Thursday and Sunday. From the villages to the airport, MCO, you can drive and park your car, or take a shared ride shuttle. A European cruise will generally involve at least one week, or probably much more, so the parking fees can be substantial. Parking at the Orlando Airport Terminal Garage is $19 a day, whereas long-term off-site parking with the shuttle service can be as low as $6 a day. A shared ride shuttle may be a good option. From the villages there are two basic options. Workman transportation, formerly the village's transportation, or the village airport van. The village's transportation has recently been acquired by workman transportation. This shuttle services has two pick-up and transfer locations, Lake Sumter Landing and Brownwood. For an extra charge, taxi service is available for pick-up and drop-off at your home, too. And from these two transfer locations. The advantage of going directly to the transfer location is that there is less time involved in dropping off or picking up other passengers through the villages. Village Airport Van is a point-to-point -point service from home to airport with no transfers. However, it is a shared ride service, so there may be substantial time involved in picking up or dropping off of other passengers throughout the villages and surrounding areas. Groom transportation has up to 20 daily round-trip shuttles between the villages in Orlando International Airport for just $19 each way with complimentary home pickup and drop-off. When going ashore please remember to take the ship's newsletter with you. It has two important pieces of information 1. The All Abroad Time and 2. The Name, Address and Phone Number of the Poor Agent. However you go, Bon Voyage. River Cruise Ships Ship or boat, what's the difference? There is no strict differentiation between the two. But the main difference is size. Generally, ships can carry boats, but not vice versa. Technically speaking, a mode of water transportation that weighs at least 500 tons is considered to be a ship. An exception to this is submarines, which no matter how large, are always called boats. Also ships generally operate in larger bodies of water such as oceans, whereas vessels in lakes, intracoastal waterways, and especially in rivers are usually called boats. So the river cruise vessels are often called boats, 
but they can with justification also be considered to be ships. However, a submarine, no matter how big or how small, is always called a boat. A typical river boat for Rhine and Danube cruises are the Viking longship class of boats of 3,500 tons, with 95 cabins for 190 passengers, and with 50 crew. This is a profile view of a Viking longship. Note that there are two and one half decks above the waterline. The standard cabins are water level cabins with small windows just above the waterline. This is the deck plan of a Viking longship. The French balcony stateroom is 135 square feet and is a river view stateroom with floor to ceiling sliding glass door to create a French balcony. This is a floor plan of the French balcony stateroom. The veranda stateroom is 205 square feet. It is a river view stateroom with a floor to ceiling sliding glass door opening to a small balcony. This is the floor plan of the veranda stateroom. This is an example of a veranda or balcony on a river cruise boat. The standard stateroom is 150 square feet with a half height window. This is a floor plan of the standard stateroom. The Aquavit Terrace is an outside sitting and dining area on the bow of the boat. This is the Aquavit Lounge with buffet-style dining. Just forward of this is the Aquavit Terrace. This is the sun deck looking towards the bow of the boat. This is the sun deck looking towards the stern of the boat. The sun deck is closed off and not accessible during some parts of the cruise due to bridge clearances. Note that the sun deck may be closed off for as much as one third to one half of the cruise due to low bridges. But the Aquavit Terrace is always available to provide an outside viewing area on the boat. This is the restaurant. The Amistella was built in 2016. It has a length of 443 feet, width of 38 feet, 78 staterooms for 156 passengers, and a crew of 51. This is the Amavila of the Ama Waterways Cruise Line. This is the deck plan of the Amistella. This is the Uniworld River Empress. It accommodates 130 passengers and 41 crew. It has a width of 37.5 feet, but the length of 361 feet is somewhat shorter than the more typical 443 feet of boats of other cruise lines. This is the deck plan of the Uniworld River Empress. The staterooms are all 151 square feet. This is the MS Aria of the Grand Circle Cruise Line. It accommodates 162 passengers in 81 cabins. This is the deck plan of the MS Aria of the Grand Circle Cruise Line. The cabins have two twin beds that convert to couches for daytime use in the evenings the couches are converted to beds. The twin beds are stationary and cannot be combined into a double bed. Is it possible to go by water all of the way across Europe from the North Sea down to the Mediterranean Sea? Yes, it is possible to go by water all of the way across Europe from the North Sea down to the Mediterranean Sea. The European Grand Loop does involve several rivers, a few canals, and a couple of straits. However, it's a very long and arduous trip. 
and there are no cruises available for this. However, taking a cruise on part of this loop, between Amsterdam and Budapest, or down to Bucharest in the Black Sea is a very popular itinerary. We'll be looking at the sea to sea, or almost, part of this loop across the continental divide of Europe in more detail. Europe, especially Western Europe is a favorite destination for river cruises. There are many navigable rivers. The distances are relatively short, and the countryside is replete with a wide range of scenic, historic, and cultural sites. We will look primarily at the most popular river cruises in Europe, those on the Rhine and the Danube. A very popular cruise is the combination of these two rivers, either as a two-week cruise between Amsterdam and Budapest, or as a longer three-week cruise between Amsterdam and Bucharest. Other cruises are in France on the Seine between Paris and Normandy. The Bordeaux region of France on the Dordogne, Garonne, and the Gironde rivers to explore the most famous vineyards in the world and the Rhone to visit the world-famous Burgundy wine country, and the city of Lyon, considered to be the culinary capital of France. Although cruises on the Rhine, Main, and Danube are certainly the most popular cruises, there are also cruises on the Elbe through the heart of Germany and into the Czech Republic with excursions to Berlin and Prague. There is the opportunity for a scenic cruise through Portugal on the Douro River, starting with a trip from Lisbon to Porto, and ending in Salamanca in Spain, with a possible excursion to Santiago de Compostela. This map shows some additional cruises through Western and Central Europe. Russia with its great rivers and vast distances offers some great opportunities for river cruises, of which a popular one is between St. Petersburg and Moscow on the Neva, Svir, the Volga Baltic Canal, and the Volga River. The Moselle is the longest tributary of the Rhine. The source of the Moselle River is in the French mountains. The Moselle then flows for 332 miles through Luxembourg and into Germany. Where it meets the Rhine at the city of Koblenz. The banks of the Moselle Valley in Germany are lined with vineyards that produce fine wines. The Moselle is famous for its scenery and castles. The Moselle runs through Germany's oldest documented city. Trier. The smaller towns of Bernkastel and Kochum attract visitors for sightseeing and wine tasting. The source of the Moselle River is in France where it is called the Meuse. The river runs through France for 280 miles, then through Belgium for another 119 miles. The Meuse, or Moselle, then enters the Netherlands, where it joins part of the Rhine south of the town of Nijmegen in a shared delta. In Belgium, the Meuse flows mainly through the French-speaking part of the country, through the towns of Namur and Liege. The river also flows through the Flemish part of Belgium, lending its Dutch name of Maas to towns of Maasmechelen in Belgium, and Maastricht in the Netherlands. The Main is one of the Rhine's most significant tributaries. It flows 324 miles from the Bavarian mountains to join the Rhine at its halfway point near Mainz. 
The mine extends from its junction with the Rhine at Mainz up through the large German city of Frankfurt, and then Miltenburg, Wurzburg, and meets the Mine Danube Canal at Bamberg. The Mine River is very curvy with a total of 34 locks between the Rhine at Mainz and the Mine Danube Canal at Bamberg. The Necker River flows north through the German state of Baden-Württemberg, past the industrial city of Stuttgart. And the university town of Heidelberg to join the Rhine at Mannheim. Rivers This illustrates some common features of rivers. This is a representative profile of a river from the source to the mouth of the river. This shows the typical profile of a river from its source to the sea or ocean. This shows the typical longitudinal and cross-sectional profiles of a river. As the gradient decreases, there is a greater amount of meandering of a river. This shows the erosion and deposition process that lead to the bending and meandering of a river. As the bending of a river increases, there often is the cutting off of a bend leaving behind an isolated oxbow lake. We will next have a short video clip of why do rivers curve. Compared to the white water streams that tumble down mountainsides, the meandering rivers of the plains may seem tame and lazy. But mountain streams are corralled by the steep walled valleys they carve. Their courses are literally set in stone. Out on the open plains, those stony walls give way to soft soil, allowing rivers to shift their banks and set their own ever-changing courses to the sea. Courses that almost never run straight. At least not for long because all it takes to turn a straight stretch of river into a bendy one is a little disturbance and a lot of time. And in nature, there's plenty of both. Say, for example, that a muskrat burrows herself a den in one bank of a stream. Her tunnels make for a cozy home, but they also weaken the bank, which eventually begins to crumble and slump into the stream. Water rushes into the newly formed hollow, sweeping away loose dirt and making the hollow even hollower, which lets the water rush a little faster and sweep away a little more dirt, and so on, and so on. As more of the stream's flow is diverted into the deepening hole on one bank and away from the other side of the channel, the flow there weakens and slows. And since slow-moving water can't carry the sand-sized particles that fast-moving water can, the dirt drops to the bottom and builds up to make the water there even shallower and slower and then keeps accumulating until it becomes new land on the inside bank. Meanwhile, the fast-moving water near the outside bank sweeps out of the curve with enough momentum to carry it across the channel and slam it into the other side, where it starts to carve another curve, and then another, and then another, and then another. The wider the stream, the longer it takes the slingshotting current to reach the other side, and the greater the downstream distance to the next curve. In fact, measurements of meandering streams all over the world reveal a strikingly regular pattern. The length of one S-shaped meander tends to be about six times the width of the channel. So little tiny meandering streams tend to look just like miniature versions of their bigger relatives. As long as nothing gets in the way of a river's meandering, its curves will continue to grow curvier and curvier until they loop around and bumble into themselves. When that happens, the river's channel follows the straighter path downhill, leaving behind a crescent-shaped remnant called an oxbow lake. Or a billabong. Or un lago en herradura. Ou un bras mort. We have lots of names for these lakes, since they can occur pretty much anywhere liquid flows, or used to. Which brings up an interesting question. What do the Martians call them? At the mouth of a river, where it enters a much larger body of water such as a lake, bay, gulf, or ocean, the speed of the water decreases, cause the increased deposition of silt, resulting in the formation of a delta and distributaries. Continental Divides Here is a continent. These are rivers flowing down into the oceans on either side of the continent. 
This is a continental divide separating the two rivers or watersheds. How do you go over a continent by water? By a canal connecting one watershed to another. Since rivers are not navigable throughout their entire length, the canals must be located below the head of navigation, which is where rivers become navigable by vessels of larger size. A continent can have more than one divide between watersheds. How do you go over this continent by water? By canals connecting one watershed to another. Sometime there may be a lake in the interior basin of a continent. This can be used as a connecting link in the transcontinental waterway. Examples of this are the Great Lakes in North America which provide a link between the St. Lawrence River and the Atlantic Ocean on the east and the Mississippi River and Gulf of Mexico on the south. Or Gatun Lake and the Panama Canal across the Isthmus of Panama. Gatun Lake carries ships for 21 miles of the entire 50-mile length of the canal. A lock is a section of the waterway, enclosed by gates at either end to allow ships to be raised or lowered to a different water level in this example. A ship enters the upper level and the gates close behind it. The water then drains into the lower level, lowering the water level of the lock in the ship. When the water level of the lock equals the level of the lower canal, the lower gates open and the ship can proceed. This is an animation of the operation of the lock. We will next have a short video clip of how canal locks work. A canal connects two bodies of water that may have different water levels. Ships traveling through the canal move from one water level to another through a lock, a rectangular chamber with watertight gates at each end. In the lock, the level of water can be raised and lowered by a system of valves and water passages. Suppose a ship is traveling from the higher water level to the lower. First, an operator at a nearby station opens the lock gates at the high end. The ship enters the lock and the lock gates are closed. Next, the lock operator opens one or more valves so that water from the lock slowly drains into the lower section of the canal. When the water in the lock is level with the lower water, the operator opens the gates and the ship sails through. To move a ship upstream, the procedure is reversed. The Ryan Rhone Canal connects the Ryan River to the Rhone which flows down to the Mediterranean. The Ryan Rhone Canal is 237 kilometers in length, but is suitable only for small craft. This is a lock on the Ryan Rhone Canal, which has a total of 112 locks. As mentioned before, we will look primarily at the most popular river cruises in Europe, those on the Rhine and the Danube. This will include the two week cruise between Amsterdam and Budapest and the longer three-week cruise between Amsterdam and Bucharest. We will first investigate the basic geography of these rivers, and how it is possible to make this long journey from sea to sea, from the North Sea to the Black Sea. However, it must be admitted that neither end of the cruise actually reaches the sea. Amsterdam is not actually on the Rhine and is close to, but not on the North Sea. And Bucharest is not on the Danube, although cruises do reach the Danube Delta at the shores of the Black Sea. Now with that understanding, 
Let's look how it's possible to go from sea to sea through Europe. Rivers do not go across continents, much less any extent of landmass from one sea to another. Narrow bodies of water that do are usually called straits, sometimes referred to as channels, or less often as passages. That is certainly not the case of the Rhine and Danube. Two good examples of straits are the Bosporus and Dardanelles Straits in Turkey that connect the Black Sea to the Mediterranean Sea, with this small sea of Marmara in between. Straits can vary greatly in length and width. It is interesting to note that the Bosporus Strait is the narrowest in the world, being only 800 meters wide between Europe and Asia. Some other examples of major straits in the world are the Strait of Dover, between England and France, which connects the North Sea with the English Channel, the Strait of Gibraltar, the only natural passage between the Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea, the Bering Strait between Alaska and Siberia, which connects the Pacific and Arctic Oceans, the Strait of Magellan, connecting the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans north of Tierra del Fuego, the Strait of Hormuz connecting the Persian Gulf and the Oman Sea, through which Persian Gulf petroleum is shipped to the world, and the Strait of Malacca, which is between peninsular Malaysia and Sumatra, and connects the Indian Ocean with the South China Sea. It is one of the highest volume shipping lanes in the world. The Rhine and Danube river systems have their sources very close to each other, just a few kilometers apart, but yet they flow in very different directions, and empty into seas very far apart. The Rhine flows north into the North Sea, a part of the Atlantic Ocean. The Danube flows mainly east and empties into the Black Sea. The Rhine and Danube river system are in geographically separate drainage basins separated by a continental divide. This map shows the main European drainage or watershed divides, red lines, separating the drainage basins or catchments, green regions. The main European watershed is the drainage divide which separates the basins of the rivers that empty into the Atlantic Ocean the North Sea and the Baltic Sea from those that feed the Mediterranean Sea, the Adriatic Sea and the Black Sea. Of interest here are the Rhine and Danube watersheds or drainage basins. The Rhine Basin includes the Rhine and other smaller rivers that all drain into the North Sea. The Danube Basin includes the Danube and a few other smaller rivers that all drain into the Black Sea. The northern drainage basins, including the Rhine and other basins that have rivers flowing to the north, drain into the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. The southern drainage basins, including the Danube and other basins that have rivers flowing to the east drain into the Black Sea, which, in turn flows into the Mediterranean Sea. Others that flow to the south go into the Mediterranean Sea. The dividing line between northern and southern drainage basins or watersheds is the European Continental Divide. Any water transportation between the North and South, between the North Sea and the Black Sea, must go over this Continental Divide. This is the European Continental Divide monument on the Main Danube Canal. This shows an example of the East-West Continental Divide in North America. This divide follows along the Rocky Mountains. Rivers to the west, such as the Columbia and Colorado flow into the Pacific Ocean. Rivers to the east of the divide, such as the Mississippi, flow into the Gulf of Mexico. There are other continental divides in North America in addition to the Great East-West Divide. For example, there is the Eastern Divide which goes along the Appalachian Mountain Range. 
Rivers to the east flow into the Atlantic Ocean, and rivers to the west flow into the Gulf of Mexico. There is also the St. Lawrence Divide, where rivers to the north flow into the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River, and thence into the Atlantic Ocean. Rivers to the south flow into the Gulf of Mexico, mostly by way of the Mississippi River and its tributaries. Turning our attention back to Europe, the Alps of Switzerland, France and Austria is the direct or indirect source of much of the rivers of Europe. The snowmelt and rainwater descending from the Alps are the source of four major rivers, Italy's Po, Germany's Rhine, Austria's Danube, and France's Rhone. It is interesting to note that none of the four major rivers flow west. The Danube and the Po receive most of their waters from the Swiss Alps. But neither the Danube or Po actually originate in the Alps of Switzerland. There is a Rhine-Rhone canal, just north of Basel, which allows a river boat to make it all the way from the North Sea to the Mediterranean. It connects the Rhine to the Du River, which connects to the Seine River, which in turn, connects to the Rhone. However, the Rhine-Rhone Canal with a length of 227 kilometers has 112 locks and only allows for a maximum boat width of 5.1 meters or 16.7 feet in length of 127 feet. So it is unsuitable for river cruise boats. The Danube starts in the Black Forest of Germany. Its largest tributary the Inn River, which is Austria's longest river, flows from the Swiss Alps through Innsbruck in Austria, and then connects to the Danube at Passau in Germany. The Po also doesn't start in the Swiss Alps, but major tributaries that feed the Po do, such as the Olio, Adda, Ticino, and the Dora Baltia. The Europeans have connected the entire continent via canals. That includes the Russians who have created the Volga Don Waterway. The Volga Don Waterway connects the Neva River of St. Petersburg Sea Red Star, on the edge of the Baltic Sea near Finland to the Volga, Europe's longest river. There are cruises on part of this route. Is for example this Uniworld cruise from St. Petersburg to Moscow in the Neva River, Lake Lodoga, Svua River, Volga Baltic Canal, to the Volga River, and finally the Moscow Canal. How is it possible to connect the Ryan and Danube River systems to provide a waterway corridor across Europe from sea to sea? These two rivers are tantalizingly close to each other in the Black Forest region of southern Germany, near to where they begin. But then they diverge, and go in opposite directions. As we have seen, the Rhine flows north into the North Sea, a part of the Atlantic Ocean, and the Danube flows mainly east and empties into the Black Sea. This map shows how close the Danube and the Rhine are to each other in the Black Forest region of southwestern Germany. One very major problem is that this point of closest approach is well above the head of navigation for both rivers, especially for the Danube. The head of navigation is the farthest point above the mouth of a river that can be navigated by ships in Many cases this limit can vary greatly with the size of the vessel, and the seasonal water level in some cases. It is fixed by the presence of a waterfall or a dam without locks. For the Rhine, the height of navigation is Basel in Switzerland under normal conditions. For the Danube it is Ulm in Germany for barges, but from Regensburg for larger craft. From Basel in Switzerland to Elm in Baden-Württemberg, Germany, the straight line distance is 203 kilometers. 
or 127 miles. From Basel in Switzerland to Regensburg in Germany the straight line distance is 372 kilometers, or 231 miles. In fact, a canal from the Rhine anywhere south, or upstream, of the region around Mainz would face extreme difficulties in getting across the mountains and hills on the eastern side of the Rhine Valley. We can see this more clearly looking at this larger scale view of mountainous terrain between the Rhine and Danube valleys. The answer to a connecting link between the two rivers is the Main River from the Rhine. And then from the Main River, the Main Danube Canal to the Danube. Between 1836 and 1846, the Ludwig Canal, or Ludwig's Canal, named for King Ludwig I of Bavaria was built between Bamberg and Kelheim. This canal followed roughly the same route as the present-day Main Danube Canal. The construction of the Ludwig Danube Mine Canal started in 1836 and was finished 10 years later in 1846. To go over the continental divide required a total of 101 locks, which made the passage extremely costly in terms of time. The passage of the entire canal required about six days, and all of the way from Amsterdam to Vienna took two months. This canal had a narrow channel, with many locks, and a shortage of water in the peak section, so the operation of the waterway soon became uneconomic, especially given the rapidly advancing construction of the railway network in southern Germany. At the beginning the Ludwig Danube Mine Canal was profitable, and the highest volume was reached in 1850. However, just ten years later in 1860, the Bavarian Maximilian Railway, Bayerische Maximiliansbahn, was completed. The expanded railway was a faster alternative and the canal declined in importance. The canal suffered heavy damage during World War II in 1945, and was finally closed in 1950. This is a map of the Ludwig Canal, or Ludwig's Canal between the Main River at Bamberg and the Danube at Kelheim. One big difference between an ocean cruise and a river cruise are all the locks along the rivers. This is a map of the entire route of a cruise between Amsterdam and Budapest. And this shows the profile of the route over the continental divide from Würzburg near the Rhine to Passau on the Danube. This is the river profile from the junction of the Rhine and Main to the Danube River, showing that many locks are required to go over the continental divide. There are no locks on the Rhine from Amsterdam to the junction with the Main River. Then there are 34 locks on the Main River, 16 locks on the Main Danube Canal, 15 locks on the Danube between Regensburg and Vienna, and one between Bratislava and Budapest. The total number of locks between Amsterdam and Budapest is 66. The Canal des Deux Mer, or in English, the Two Seas Canal describes the path from the Atlantic to the Mediterranean, of which the Canal du Midi was the first man-made component, and the second is the Canal de Gironde. There are river barge-type cruises on the Canal du Midi. This is an example of an eight-passenger hotel barge on the Canal du Midi. This shows the location of the cruises on the Canal du Midi. America's Great Loop Is it possible to go by water all of the way around the eastern part of the U.S. from the Gulf of Mexico to the Atlantic Ocean and back? Yes. 
It is indeed possible to go by water all of the way around the eastern part of the U.S., from the Gulf of Mexico to the Atlantic Ocean and back. It's called America's Great Loop. You can go up the Mississippi River to the Illinois River just north of St. Louis. Then on Illinois River and some short canals to Lake Michigan near Chicago. Then through the Great Lakes. Using the Welland Canal to get around Niagara Falls to the St. Lawrence River. Then down Lake Champlain to the Hudson River to New York City and the Atlantic Ocean. This is the Great Loop. A circumnavigation of the eastern U.S. and part of Canada. It is a system of waterways that encompasses the eastern portion of the United States and part of Canada. The Great Loop is made up of both natural and man-made waterways, including the Atlantic and Gulf Intracoastal Waterways, the Great Lakes, Lake Champlain, and the Mississippi and Tennessee Tom Big B Waterway. The entire loop stretches about 6,000 miles, 9,700 kilometers. You too can become a looper by joining the America's Great Lakes Cruisers Association. Or, you can do just part of the loop. Like taking a cruise on the Mississippi River or the Great Lakes. We will next have a short video clip of introduction to the Great Loop. This is a map of the principal hydrological divides of North America. The St. Lawrence River Divide, Magenta Line, separates the Great Lakes, St. Lawrence Watershed from the southerly watersheds of the Atlantic Ocean.
The U.S. Intracoastal Waterway, ICW. The U.S. Intracoastal Waterway, ICW, is a 3,000-mile inland waterway along the Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico coasts of the United States running from Boston, Massachusetts, southward along the Atlantic seaboard and around the southern tip of Florida, then following the Gulf Coast to Brownsville, Texas. Some sections of the waterway consist of natural inlets, saltwater rivers, bays, and sounds, while others are artificial canals. It provides a navigable route along its length without many of the hazards of travel on the open sea. The Intracoastal Waterway has two main sections. The Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway serves ports from Boston to Key West, Florida. The route is linked by several essential man-made canals, including the Cape Cod, Chesapeake and Delaware, and Chesapeake Albemarle. The second part is the Gulf Intracoastal Waterway that serves ports for more than 1,100 miles between Brownsville, Texas and Apalachee Bay, Florida. The Gulf Intracoastal Waterway lies mainly behind barrier beaches and provides a 150-foot wide, 12-foot deep channel. At its eastern end, the waterway is not directly connected with its Atlantic counterpart, except via the open waters of the Gulf of Mexico and the 6-foot deep Okeechobee Waterway in southern Florida. The Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway the Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway runs from Norfolk, Virginia to the Florida Keys. It consists of natural inlets, saltwater rivers, bays, sounds, and artificial canals. It provides a navigable route along its length, without many of the hazards of travel on the open sea. Congress authorized the creation of the Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway in 1919 and the entire waterway was completed in 1940. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is responsible for maintaining the waterway. An important link in the inland waterways of the U.S. is from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico. This connects Lake Michigan to the Mississippi River via the Illinois Waterway. The Illinois Waterway System provides a navigable link from the Atlantic Ocean via the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Great Lakes to the heartland of the U.S. and the Gulf of Mexico. The Illinois Waterway provides a shipping connection from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico via the Illinois and Mississippi Rivers. The Illinois Waterway is a system of rivers, lakes, and canals which consists of 336 miles, 541 kilometers, of waterways from the mouth of the Calumet River near Chicago and Lake Michigan to the junction of the Illinois and Mississippi Rivers at Grafton, Illinois. This illustrates the drop of the Illinois waterway from 578 feet, 176 m above sea level at Lake Michigan to 419 feet, 128 m, at the Mississippi River at Grafton, Illinois. There are eight locks and dams on the waterway. The Bays Plains River, which flows into the Illinois River of the Mississippi River Basin, is very close to the shores of Lake Michigan near Chicago and the Great Lakes Basin. This is a map and profile of the Illinois Waterway from the Mississippi River to Lake Michigan near Chicago. This is the Illinois-Michigan Canal that connects the Illinois River to Lake Michigan near Chicago. The canal opened in 1848. In 1900, the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal replaced it and reversed the flow of the Chicago River, so it no longer flowed into Lake Michigan.
The United States Army Corps of Engineers maintains a 9-foot deep navigation channel in the waterway. This is the water route from the St. Lawrence River up the Richelieu River, the Chambly Canal, Lake Champlain, the Champlain Canal, and the Hudson River to the Atlantic Ocean. Lake Champlain is a natural freshwater lake bordering the states of Vermont and New York, and also the Canadian province of Quebec. Lake Champlain has a maximum length of 107 miles, 172 kilometers, and is quite narrow, with a maximum width of only 14 miles, 23 kilometers. The Chambly Canal is a National Historic Site of Canada in the province of Quebec. It is part of a waterway that connects the St. Lawrence River with the Hudson River in the United States. The Chambly Canal has 10 bridges, 8 of which are hand-operated and 9 hydraulic locks. The canal is 20 kilometers or 12 miles long, with a typical passage time of 3 to 5 hours. The Champlain Canal is a 60-mile, 97-kilometers, canal that connects the south end of Lake Champlain to the Hudson River in New York. It was simultaneously constructed with the Erie Canal and is now part of the New York State Canal System and the Lakes to Locks Passage. The Erie Canal This is a view on the Erie Canal painted 1830 by John William Hill. We will next have a short video clip of the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal is a man-built waterway that travels across New York State and connects a path from the Great Lakes to the Atlantic Ocean. And it probably would never have happened if it weren't for the determination and vision of a man named DeWitt Clinton. Clinton was the governor of New York, and he was convinced that building a canal would sustainably lower the cost of bringing goods from all over the country to his entire state. Not everyone agreed with him though, including President Thomas Jefferson, who thought the idea was crazy and refused to offer federal funding for the project. Luckily, Clinton was able to convince the state legislature to give $7 million for the construction. Work began on the canal in 1817, and one of the first problems was getting a stable workforce. Hiring locals was a failure, but soon Irish immigrants heard there was steady work in upstate New York and flocked to the project where they made 80 cents a day, a good salary at the time. The work was hard and long, and the laborers worked 14-hour days. Most of them didn't know anything about digging a canal, and they had to learn as they worked, developing tools and techniques along the way. It took years to dig the 363-mile-long canal. When it was finished, it was 40 feet wide and only 4 feet deep. Bands played and cannons boomed when Clinton opened the canal in 1825, and he was vindicated when it became an immediate success. Goods and people were able to travel faster and more cheaply, and trade was easier. The tolls collected soon paid the state of New York back for the entire cost of construction. Skeptics who first grumbled about DeWitt's ditch were proved wrong, and the success of the Erie Canal would soon inspire the building of more U.S. canals. We know about the Panama Canal that goes from coast to coast. What is the Florida Canal? The Cross Florida Barge Canal would save three days of travel for ships if they didn't have to go all the way around the Florida Peninsula, and could instead cut right through the middle of the state. The planned route of the canal followed the St. Johns River from the Atlantic coast to Palatka, the valley of the Eklaha River to the Coastal Divide, and the Withlacoochee River to the Gulf of Mexico. About 28% of the 107-mile, 172-kilometers project was built. This is a completed section of the Cross Florida Barge Canal near Palatka.
today. The Marjorie Harris Car Cross Florida Greenway provides hiking and biking trails on the remnants of the Cross Florida Barge Canal. This is the Cross Florida Greenway Bridge over I-75, just north of Marion Oaks. This shows the location of the Cross Florida Greenway Bridge on I-75, just north of Marion Oaks and east of Bellevue. What is the Cross Florida Railroad? The Cross Florida Railroad from Fernandina on the Atlantic was started August 1856 and reached Cedar Key on the Gulf in March 1861. The Cross Florida Railroad ran through Gainesville and was 155 miles long from coast to coast. Trade between ports like New Orleans and those in the Northeast U.S. no longer had to go around the Florida Keys. Is it possible to go by water all of the way across the U.S. from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean? This is the elevation profile across the U.S. from San Francisco to New York City. It looks impossible to go across by water. But they did it. However, you have to be a fish with tremendous endurance. It is believed that this was how the cutthroat trout migrated from the Snake River on the Pacific drainage to the Yellowstone River on the Atlantic drainage. I start in the Pacific Ocean. And then it's the Columbia River Snake River north to Ocean Creek Pacific Creek. And then the Atlantic Creek Yellowstone River Missouri River Mississippi River Gulf of Mexico Straits of Florida. And finally the Atlantic Ocean. Here is a map showing the rivers of the U.S. Here we see that the Yellowstone River. A tributary of the Missouri is very close to the Snake River. A tributary of the Columbia. At the Continental Divide in Wyoming. This is the two ocean pass on the North American Continental Divide. In the Rocky Mountains of Wyoming near Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Parks. This is the two ocean creek. This shows two ocean pass in the Teton Wilderness, near Jackson Lake in Wyoming. The Teton Wilderness in northwestern Wyoming, just south of Yellowstone National Park, is one of the most remote and rugged places in America. There one can see a branching of two ocean creek called Parting of the Waters. The Two Ocean Creek is an unremarkable little forest stream. But, as you might guess from its name, it's the only creek in America that flows into two oceans. And it is a 1,300-mile float to the nearest ocean. This unique hydrological spot was named a National Natural Landmark in 1965. The sign gives the distance in miles to the oceans as Atlantic Ocean 3488 and Pacific Ocean 1353. If you connect the two creeks watersheds on a map, they form a single line connecting Oregon and Louisiana. So the northeastern two-thirds of North America is technically an island. The explorers looking for the northwest passage between the oceans never realized that they could have sailed across America this way. If they'd used tiny little boats that could handle the six-inch depths of Two Ocean Creek. The Two Ocean Pass is notable for the parting of the waters, where one stream, North Two Ocean Creek, splits into two distributaries, Pacific Creek and Atlantic Creek at the parting of the Waters National Natural Landmark. The Atlantic Creek water eventually flows into the Yellowstone River and empties into the Gulf of Mexico via the Missouri River and Mississippi River.
The Pacific Creek water eventually flows into the Snake River and empties into the Pacific Ocean via the Columbia River. This is a drawing made in 1894 of two ocean pass with a view to the northeast. Atlantic Creek exits the pass between the hills in the upper part of the image. Pacific Creek exits to the southwest in the lower part of the image. North to Oceans Creek enters from the left side of the image, and divides into its two distributaries and South to Ocean Creek enters from the right of the image, and is also shown dividing into two streams. Here the two Ocean Creek splits in two directions on the Continental Divide. Water on the left goes to the Atlantic and water on the right goes to the Pacific Ocean. The Snake River has its headwaters just inside Yellowstone National Park formed by the confluence of three tiny head streams on the two ocean plateau, very close to the Continental Divide. One of the streams that feeds the Snake River is the Two Ocean Creek, at the Two Ocean Pass, a mountain pass on the Continental Divide. The Two Ocean Creek abruptly splits into the separate streams one going off to the left and the other to the right. Each stream is joined by larger and larger streams, and eventually reach the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. The stream to the left, called the Atlantic Creek, travels 3,500 miles, 5,613 kilometers, joining up with the waters of the Mississippi River and winding up in the Atlantic Ocean. The stream to the right, called the Pacific Creek, undertakes a 1,350-mile, 2,177 kilometers, trip joining up with the Snake and Columbia Rivers and empties into the Pacific Ocean. Aptly named the Two Ocean Creek, it's the only one in the United States that breaks and ends up in two different oceans. The point where the bifurcation occurs is called parting of the waters and it sits directly atop the Continental Divide. Technically, it's possible for a fish to make the nearly 5,000-mile, 8,000-kilometers, freshwater journey from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean via the Two Ocean Creek. In fact, it is believed that this was how the cutthroat trout migrated from the Snake River, on the Pacific drainage, to Yellowstone River, on the Atlantic drainage. Table of Contents